Hello, everyone. I am Linda Burton, the Dean of the School of Social Welfare at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm here to welcome you to this conversation on the roles of digital technology and telehealth amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Please enjoy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is David Lindemann. I'm Director of Health at the Citrus uh, Program here at UC Berkeley, and delighted to have you with us today. And you will shortly be hearing from several of our campus experts who have been working in the space of telehealth and remote monitoring that have become critical in this area this time of COVID. We're very fortunate that we have this type of expertise because uh, we are now seeing tremendous changes in the way we obviously have to socially distance, how we get services, and how we need to support each other. What we have noticed in the last two months is a tremendous change in the way we use technology in this space, particularly in terms of telehealth. Our University of California campuses have seen a literally 1,000% increase in the amount of telehealth. We are seeing new ways to reach people at their homes in the community. We're also seeing new ways to collect information and for people to share it with each other and to support each other as we deal with mental health issues and other types of service needs. So today you are going to hear from four of our experts. A little background, we will, in addition to hearing from these faculty and individuals who are working in the community, we will have an opportunity for not only them to share their information, but for you to ask questions. So as we get to the end of the program, we'll be turning to the chat. We would look forward to you sharing your questions with us. And we will wrap up uh, before the hour with a few ideas and examples of what's coming next. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four individuals. We're going to be having Heather Ladoff, who is a LCSW and a mental health supervisor at La Clinica here in Oakland. Uh, she's at Casa del Sol right here, and she will be followed by Elaine Koenig, a physician who is a general internist, assistant professor of medicine at the Zuckerberg's San Francisco General Hospital. Following that will be Courtney Lyles, who's associate professor at UCSF and the Division of General Internal Medicine again, and at uh, General Hospital. And she's also at the UC Center, UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. And finally, we'll hear from Adrian Aguilar, our colleague from here at the School of Social Welfare, who's associate professor. And he's also at the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Francisco. We're going to ask each colleague to spend a few minutes talking from their specific area. And then we will hold for questions until we've heard from all four of them. And then they have, we have a few general comments that we'd like to share with you around the importance of this area how people will be able to work and anticipate telehealth and remote monitoring going forward in the future. And as I said, we will entertain your questions at that point. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Heather. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Ledove. I'm a social worker um, at La Clinica, Casa del Sol Outpatient Mental Health Clinic in East Oakland. And we provide uh, mental health services, therapy case management, psychiatry, peer support, uh, individually and in groups formally, um, and to primarily Spanish speakers from Mexico and Central America. And the majority of our population are uh, newly arrived and have, this is their first experience engaging with mental health services. So just to kind of set the stage for the work on the ground that we're doing at La Clinica. So I'm just gonna go over some notes that we have taken in over the last two and a half months of moving into telehealth to note this challenges and struggles. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we've learned and sort of how we've adapted. We have really struggled with video um, and technology. And it's sort of both the, uh, technological piece of downloading the apps and, and entering in the meeting code and doing all of that. Um, and I think resistance to video in general. Um, and it, it's sort of interesting because you would think that teenagers have more technological savvy than, than we do, but even there is some resistance there around the video 
uh, around the video chat. I would also say that we haven't gotten a ton of clarity from the Board of Behavioral Services, um, as well as our county and our clinic around moving beyond Zoom into WhatsApp. That was a recommendation on another webinar that I was on because a lot of our uh, population use WhatsApp to communicate with people internationally. But in terms of confidentiality and how that works, we haven't moved past Zoom at this point. And again, I'll say that using Zoom has been challenging so that we've mostly done telephone um, in the way for, in, for telehealth. Um, struggles that we have had with our population, particularly around children and play therapy, trying to do that over the telephone is really challenging. Um, and services that are really around engagement, particularly for younger children, have been really hard. And for people that have negative symptoms of schizophrenia or depression, people that really struggle with communicating um, or have thought disorders, transitioning to telehealth has been really hard. Um, another element would be privacy. Our community really live in small spaces with many people. And so trying to carve out space to get on a video chat or to be on the phone has been really, really challenging. Um, especially when people are looking at more deep level issues related to trauma or things that they don't want to be shared with the rest of their family, which is the majority of therapy, really. Um, we've really had a hard time finding space and privacy confidentiality to make that happen. I'll also say that for clients that we've had for a long time and have existing relationships with, I think that the transition to telehealth has been easier. We continue to open up new clients every day. And when we're just meeting someone over the phone or um, by video, again, I'll say that much less by video, it's really hard to build a relationship when we haven't have no physical context for someone. Um, I know that this week, this last week, I opened up two young men, 19 and 22, with very similar stories. And I'm having a really hard time differentiating each person, what their story is, how to write the note, because they're getting very jumbled up in my mind um, when I don't have those physical traits to, to marker them for me. So moving into lessons learned, I think that flexibility has been really important for us. Um, we are flexible in general with our clients that have work that come up or different contexts that make a specific appointment every week hard. But even more now, we I know my colleagues are calling people throughout the day. So we may have had an appointment at nine to speak with someone, but we're really trying to engage them throughout the day, calling them over and over again to see if they'll pick up, when they'll pick up, how we can find them. So really having therapeutic flexibility and then structured flexibility so that you can roll with it if, if um, someone's not available at the time that we set. Um, really trying to move beyond just the check-in around what's going on with their shelter in place or how they're doing with the quarantine. Um, that is a more easy way of engaging people, but we're wanting to do deeper level therapy and get into the issues that are beyond just what's happening in this moment, whether it be previous trauma or other issues that um, have been going on for a long time. And so trying to push beyond just the, hey, how are you? How are you doing right now? Um, has been something that we've been really working on. I think that what we found to be helpful is to have some plan in place around an activity or some structure for the therapy as we're going into it. Um, thinking about a, creating a timeline together, using a memory from the past to delve deeper into, to try to, whether it's a positive, a negative, a neutral memory, to try to build in that into it, a session. So it's, it, it creates depth and goes further. Um, I also think that negotiating the time with our clients has been helpful to say that I'd like to stay on the phone with you for about 30 minutes today. Would you be willing to do that? And so we find that in therapy when we have a container, whether it's the 50 minute hour or something like that, that more comes up when you create more space for someone. And so if we're just like, hey, how are you doing on the phone? Um, that could be really quick. But if we can negotiate for more time and really allow what comes up in the silence or in the space, we found that there's more opportunity there. I also think it's a very you know, simple therapeutic technique, but validating that being on the phone or being in a video chat is, chat is challenging. Um, and just naming that, that we're struggling, we know they're struggling, but this is what we have right now. And so to really um, name, the, name the struggle and 
be able to talk about that too creates um, some more some more communication and more acknowledgement that this is a hard time, but we're working with what we have. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, wonderful start to share with us the types of issues and challenges, but also your ability to connect with your uh, population and your clients. We'd now I'd like to turn to Elaine, Elaine Koenig, who will take a different perspective and share with us their work at UCSF. Thanks, David. So I'm Elaine Kong. I'm a assistant professor at UCSF, a health services research, and I'm a primary care clinician at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, which is the county hospital in San Francisco. I also have a role as an informaticist there and some doing some quality improvement work for um, hypertension and diabetes. And what I'd like to cover today um, in my introductory remarks are really just give you an overview of um, really how, what type of remote care we were doing before COVID and then how things have really changed um, since COVID and then also um, the challenges that we've encountered with, with some of that changes. Um, and just to get us started, you know, when I think about remote care, I think there's been a lot of focus on telehealth and how clinicians have changed how they've delivered care to patients. I think another aspect of care that I want to touch upon as well is actually um, the remote care that happens between between clinicians. And that's actually um, initially before we started COVID back in you know January, this is really the primary way that our health system was doing remote care. So we were actually one of the earliest health systems to use electronic consults, which is actually when I as a primary care clinician have a question about a patient that I think might need specialty input. Um, we can send the consult to the specialist and they'll review the patient's chart in advance and look over over, um, the chart and decide if the patient maybe needs any type of imaging or additional labs before the patient actually comes in for that in-person appointment. And really that's primarily the extent of the type of remote care that we were doing in our health system beforehand. In terms of interactions with patients remotely, we had a patient portal, which um, Dr. Lyles will cover in more detail later, but that's where patients have the ability to access their online medical records. And that really had pretty low adoption, um, adoption in our health system. I think similar to what Heather touched upon, um, our health system primarily serves a really large um, low-income immigrant population. Um, and specifically in our clinic, about 50% of our patients have limited English proficiency. And so accessing information um, remotely can, can be difficult. By the middle of March into the end of March, um, we really had a huge change in how we delivered care. And I think the really biggest change um, and that the thing that sort of a lot of people have focused on is really that um, instead of having patients come in in person for care, we are really delivering a lot of our care remotely. So, you know, in January, I would say probably you know, like less than 5% of even that um, of our appointments were done remotely. Very few people in our health system were doing that. And by the end of March, really over 80% or 90% of our care was delivered remotely. And within our health system, that primarily was um, through phone. And um, really the main reason for that is that um, one, a lot of the clinics actually didn't have the infrastructure to deliver video visits. So even for those of us who are doing video visits right now, we're primarily doing it um, through our own smartphones, our own devices. Another barrier that came up um, is that, you know, initially we actually didn't have a, a contract with Zoom or some of these other software tools that allow for safe HIPAA access to, um, to do video visits. So that was another barrier um, as well. And then I think as Heather mentioned as well, you know, a lot of our patients struggle with you know, access to devices or um, the ability to actually navigate, navigate video visits. Um, but so that was sort of the biggest, one of the biggest changes is that we moved from in-person care to remote care. I think another big change that we noticed was actually just in the number of appointments that we had. So in the very beginning, actually, there was a huge drop off in the number of patients that were seeking primary care. And I think a lot of that was actually, there's a lot of confusion about what type of care was being offered and how they could access it. I know that a lot of my patients would get reminders about appointments and they actually thought that was a reminder about an in-person appointment, not realizing that they could actually have the appointment over the phone. And so there's been a huge drop off in appointments that have now really picked up and, and personally now we're close to where we were before, probably 80 or 90% of visits. But again, that's because we're doing phone visits. I know when I speak to colleagues at um, UCSF Health where they've done a lot more video visits, they've actually continued to see that drop off in the appointments um, because of the type of pay patients who are able to access video visits. And so I think the third thing that I wanna to touch upon in terms of things that have changed is really the type of patients that have been able to access care. So I think there's definitely been barriers for some of our patients. So thinking of patients who don't have phones, who don't have a safe or private location to do a phone visit or a video visit. 
Um, but for some of my patients who actually have mobility issues, who actually live pretty far away from clinic, I've actually been able to access them a lot more and um, check in with them a lot more frequently than I was able to do so before. I think the um, second thing that has really changed a lot is um, the clinician to clinician interactions. So one of the primary tenets of high quality primary care is actually co-locating um, the clinician in the same location as the nurse, the medical assistant, our pharmacist, our behavioral health colleagues, so that we can think about patients in really a multidisciplinary way. And now that a lot of people are, um, we're working remotely from home and also because we're trying to avoid the having a large number of people in clinic, it's actually been a lot harder to have that type of multidisciplinary um, conversation about our patients and how best to support our care. And so I know as a clinician, now we're, you know, I'm personally checking in the patients myself. I've had to reschedule patients myself. Um, these are sort of just putting a lot more burden on the clinician. And so I think um, as we've changed some of our care, um, there's been a couple of challenges that, that, we've, uh, that have come up um, and that we've started to sort of think about addressing. Um, the first is really the, the shift in how we think about team-based care. Um, we had really developed a good team-based care for an in-person model, and we still haven't quite developed how we're going to move team-based care into a digital, digital approach. I think another issue that's really come up is how do we provide high quality um, remote care? So, you know, for my patients with a lot of chronic diseases, really checking in on their blood pressure and diabetes can be difficult if they're unable to, if we're unable to measure blood pressure. And this is, is um, this is a barrier because um, not every single insurance company reimburses for blood pressure. And so I don't, I don't actually know how somebody's blood pressure is doing. Um, and then I think a really large issue that sort of a lot of us have stressed upon is, uh, is a concern about equity. So who's accessing care, the type of care that they're accessing, really being able to communicate to them um, how to access care in, in remote ways and also really providing them with resources to be able to access um, video care, which we do know is, is, is better than phone visits when we can get that, um, get that done. Elaine, thank you so much. You've really taken us through a number yep. of specific issues uh, related not only to the client uh, perspective, but also the multiple challenges we have from the provider perspective. And we'll want to come back and visit those as a group shortly. I'd like to next turn to Courtney, Dr. Lyles, who will speak from another perspective, please. Thank you so much, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, I faculty at UCSF um, with Elaine in the Center for Vulnerable Populations, and I also um, am an um, adjunct faculty in the School of Public Health in Berkeley. And um, I think I'm gonna, I really love starting with the on the ground experiences of clinicians. I think that was a really important way to start our conversation today. I'm, I'm not a clinician, so I'm gonna potentially zoom out a little bit and give you some of my perspectives of um, the broader work that we've done on diverse patient engagement with digital health, which I think is really relevant for thinking about telehealth in the time of COVID and, um, hope, and emphasize, I think, some of the points that both Heather and Elaine um, just made. I wanted to make the point, and I think one other thing I'll say is the equity focus. I just am very honored to be on a panel where all of us are so focused on the equity point of telehealth um, in this time of COVID. So thinking nationally about um, patients and how patients interact with digital health tools, I just wanted to ground the conversation to say that um, before COVID, it was pretty well known that the digital divide in smartphone ownership or high-speed internet at home we're shrinking for some categories, like many, many people are now own smartphones. But there actually have been persistent gaps um, in smartphone ownership and in high-speed internet at home, especially for low-income individuals, which I think Elaine and Heather really spoke nicely about, and older Americans. And, and I think a lot of times in my work, it, it's come up a lot, especially in urban centers like San Francisco, where I think the assumption is that almost everybody is connected um, that when you think really granularly about the data of who's accessing tools to actually be able to do a video visit or even a phone visit, as Elaine mentioned, having a phone and owning a phone, um, there's been some pretty good data um, from something um, in the San Francisco Mayor's Office for Housing and Community Development within our city and county. Um, the digital health, um, the, rather the digital equity initiative found pretty big disparities that mirror those national trends. So among low-income San Franciscans, for example, uh, only 59% of them report having both um, high-speed internet at home and basic skills and being able to use that. And, and basic skills would be something like um, searching for information online or text messaging or sending an email. So there's a pretty big gap um, compared to that group versus you know, over 97 or 98% of higher income San Franciscans who are able to do um, all of those tasks um, easily. 
And I think this pandemic has really shown a light on some of the digital equity issues that we have in our country um, and some of the strategies that we need to think about across. When we think about health, that's a really front and center issue now, but we also have seen it in education and employment and all sorts of other domains. And it's, I think we need to be more unified in how we think about some of those underlying um, categories of how people use technology and how they're able to access them. The second thing I wanted to speak on briefly was just that uh, we don't know actually that much about um, video visits in the context of ongoing primary care or even mental health care, I would say. There's a lot more literature um, thinking about that modality um, in, in different systems like Kaiser who have had that for a while and also for a lot of asynchronous care like um, specialty care, telehealth or things like that. There's actually less evidence um, or information out there about um, video visits as a platform for ongoing relationship building that I think both Elaine and Heather both also touched on. But we do know about patient portal use, I would say as a proxy for some of that. So when you think about patients being able to access their own medical record information and logging into a website to download their recent visit summary or to be able to send an email to their doctor or things like that, um, we've been studying that now for over a decade. And I would say a lot of the same issues come up. And so when we think about racial differences and who's using patient portals or health literacy or language barriers, those persist in patient portal use. And I say, we have to be very aware of that in this world of telehealth so that we're not exacerbating existing disparities of how we think about care. And then the other final point about um, patient portal research I think might be relevant for us is um, people are really interested in that modality. Although may, not everybody might be able to engage in those technology um, tasks or to be able to, make a secure password to log on to a patient portal website, there's actually pretty high interest in being able to do that as long as it can preserve in-person relationships and as long as they have the technical support um, to be able to ask questions and to, to be able to, to use it and stay using it on, um, on an ongoing basis. So I think those are things to think about. Um, and then language barriers is the last point I wanted to make about there's obviously some significant language barriers that come up with patient portal use for things we push out um, in terms of health tech um, for our populations. And we need to be thinking about, I would say, use of interpreters via telehealth and how to do that effectively for all of our patients, um, either by phone or by video visit, and how to do that in a more seamless way. So they're not, again, not bleeding people out or exacerbating anything that's um, existing healthcare disparities in our system. So I wanted to close by saying, I, I hope that um, this, time, this moment in time can maybe bring forward um, uh, access to technology and access to both devices, high-speed internet, um, and the skills to be able to use those, the so digital literacy skills as a moment that we can maybe unify across domains to support unified policies and programs to bring us into the future so that everybody has access to these, these services moving forward. Um, and I wanted to um, end by saying that there are many, many community-based partners, I think, that are out there ready to partner with us on this work outside of the healthcare space I mentioned the SF Digital Equity Initiative in the, in the government. There's also many nonprofits, public libraries um, that focus on supporting people and learning how to use technology and managing it. And I think um, that's a new possibility potential that we should probably be making more bridges um, moving forward. Thank you very much, Courtney. Uh, appreciate your starting us really to keep uh, focusing on the issues of access and the, uh, again, the very great differences we have in terms of accessibility to these programs and some of the other barriers. And we'll come back to that in our discussion section. I'd like to turn now to Adrian Aguilar, who will take us through one more program that he's been developing with colleagues, both at UCSF and UC Berkeley. Great, thank you, David. Um, so I wanted to start with just uh, giving you a little bit more context around myself, um, just to frame a, uh, more about my work. Um, so as mentioned, I'm a faculty member in the School of Social Welfare, where I uh, lead the Digital Health Equity and Access Lab. Um, and I'm also the director of the Latinx Center of Excellence, which seeks to train behavioral health workers in uh, uh, mental health uh, work focused on Latinx populations. At UCSF, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry, where I lead the Latinx Mental Health Research Program. Um, and I'm also part of the Center for Vulnerable Populations. So as you probably noticed, uh, issues of equity, um, issues of access, um, focuses on uh, populations of color, 
um, are very important to me. And I may or may not have had a hand in putting this uh, panel together um, so that we can focus on those issues that I think are very important. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of frame about some of the work that I've done and some of the lessons that we've learned that hopefully will lead us into applying uh, uh, the principles into this new time of COVID. So I focus on developing text messaging uh, interventions for uh, people with uh, mental health uh, problems. I started developing a texting uh, platform uh, where we sent messages out to folks who were in cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. Uh, we started this around 10 years ago. And we found that by sending messages to people during the week while they're in treatment, we were able to increase engagement in the live intervention. Um, so we're not doing live interventions anymore at the moment, uh, but one of the key takeaways that we found from this research is that as much as we focus on technology, uh, a lot of the success around digital and telehealth is around people and the relationships that patients have with their providers. Uh, when we ask for feedback around uh, how did these text messages help you, uh, people mentioned that they felt connected to their providers. They felt cared for and supported. So it's really important that we not lose sight uh, that it's not technology first, it's people first, and the technology enables those relationships. Um, that's what uh, patients look for when they're trying to get uh, high quality healthcare. Uh, we also, along with uh, my colleague, Dr. Lyles, we recently developed a uh, intervention to improve physical activity for folks with diabetes and depression. And one of the things that we found uh, obviously to be challenging is how do you engage in physical activity in the time of social distance? Uh, we would often encourage people to walk with others or to go to parks or things like that. And we're realizing that uh, the limitations that people have, uh, particularly in urban environments where there's less space, uh, when focused on focusing on people with uh, chronic illnesses and their exposure, and so we really need to think about how we can still encourage people to maintain healthy lifestyles while limiting their risks of exposure. And that's something we're actively working on. And I think we're using technology to try to help uh, relay this information to people. Uh, so as you've noticed, uh, one of the things that we've also learned is to start with some of the basic technologies at the very least and utilize those as much as we can to engage people. Um, in terms of the area of mental health, uh, broadly kind of stepping back a little bit, we've relied a lot on face-to-face -face as a standard form of intervention. Um, and in a lot of ways, we've been hesitant to integrate technology. Uh, but now we've been thrust into it. As a colleague mentioned, uh, the genie's out of the bottle. Uh, we have to do this. And the reality is that in some form or another, this is going to continue to be the norm. Um, so we have to find ways to make this work. Um, there's a saying in therapy that patients cannot fail in therapy. Um, and I believe that we need to modify this a little bit and say patients cannot fail in telehealth or digital health. The systems, the providers, uh, can fail and the onus then is on us to ensure success. And what this means is that we need to um, stop improving along the margins and instead innovate with and for those with the highest needs. Uh, we need to do that by starting with the basics as was mentioned before by Dr. Lyles. We need to provide uh, access to uh, high-speed internet via uh, hotspots or any other uh, methods that are possible. We need to provide training, tutorials. We can't emphasize that enough. Um, it's not enough to throw our hands up and say this isn't possible. We have to find ways to do it because COVID-19 is exposing existing uh, disparities um, as we're seeing the disproportionate impact on communities of color. Um, we're also seeing the impacts of policy and that policies can make, uh, can speed these things along. Uh, HIPAA was softened and allowed uh, the use of various video platforms. Uh, and I think that that showed the way that we can speed this along. 
Uh, and instead of focusing on their barriers and the reasons why we can't do this, we need to really um, put our heads together and figure out how we can do this. So thank you very much for joining us and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Well, thank you, Adrian. And uh, thank you to all members of our panel. As you've already seen, we have an amazing set of experts and deep experience and particularly looking at some of the issues that COVID is starting to show in terms of challenges with accessibility, the issue of disparity and how we'll have to address those. But let's start quickly. We'd now like to have our panel have some interaction and share some points. We have a few questions for them, but we invite you to send us via the chat some questions that we can handle. We have a few coming in. We look forward to more. But let me start on a positive question for everyone. You have all exp expressed some of the challenges, but clearly some of the benefits, not only for your clients, but also for the provider community uh, and how those have changed. But back to the individuals who are now seeing this for the first time and or experiencing telehealth or using remote uh, technologies, what would you each say, and again, we'll put this out to the group, are some of the most impressive changes and benefits that you're hearing from your clients? We heard a few, but could you each share your perspective on what this is doing to change their outlook in terms of their healthcare, their engagement, their satisfaction? Please, the floor is open. I just wanted to start with um, some conversations with colleagues that I've had. Uh, we have noticed that for some people, this has actually improved access. Uh, uh, with uh, a colleague at a clinic at the General Hospital mentioned that their no-show rates for their appointments have actually decreased since starting telehealth. Um, and I think this type of information shows us that Telehealth is here to stay, and we're going to be doing more of this, even if COVID somehow magically disappears, because it can be a tool to remove access barriers for some folks. Um, so it's important to focus on that. That being said, obviously, there are the barriers that we talked about, but um, this really makes us realize that there are no one-size-fits-all approaches. Um, part of uh, this approach can help many people, and we just need to make sure to keep expanding that pool. Yeah, I would just add to that um, convenience of care is obviously a potential real advantage of telehealth. Um, they'd be not having to take um, multiple forms of public transportation or drive across the city to an appointment. Obviously, that's an advantage of these kinds of modalities. And I would say the second advantage is really about the support for managing whatever condition or issue um, closer to the time in which you're wanted to do the behavior. So if you have a chronic illness, like Elaine was mentioning, and you want to think about it, if you can talk to somebody about their blood pressure in their everyday life, you probably have a better chance of maybe making some adjustments than only seeing them every three months and maybe not um, being able to uh, be closer to that to that behavior. So I think those are some advantages. I think the, doubt, the, the ability to do that and to still keep those interpersonal connections and to, to really... Um, to drive the, the relational and then the continuity of care, I think is the, this flip side that we've been spending time on, but there are obviously advantages for all people to do more convenient things um, through, through virtual modalities, telephone or video. I, I just wanna sort of echo, I guess, everybody's comments. Um, definitely, I've had patients who I've been unable to see. Um, I have one patient who basically no-showed for like four or five straight appointments with me, um, lives about an hour and a half away. Um, but made it to our first phone visit, right? That's like very accessible for that patient. I have another patient who requires oxygen and therefore leaving the house is, is um, quite difficult and we've been able to check in much more frequently. And so I think telehealth definitely has a role for certain types of patients. And um, as Adrian mentioned, it's just maybe not the best for every single patient. We have to figure out which ones are best for in-person care versus telehealth. Um, I wanna thank Adrian for that kind of pep talk. <laughs> Because I feel like, you know, just acknowledging that no one, no one fails in telehealth is really, I don't know, it really helps me to frame where, the work that we need to do. And I think that we're all slow to change and slow to adapt. Some people are like, let's get on board with new technology and let's do this. And other people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we see that with our clients and we see that with our colleagues, right? And so 
I've watched that in our clinic around some people are like, let's get everybody on Zoom. And some people are like, no, Zoom doesn't work. Um, so I think that having this kind of pep talk, like, yes, you can do it. Yes, this is here to stay. It's not about, um, it's not about creating, it's like not, not about necessarily acknowledging the barriers, so that's important, but also um, figuring it out. And I think some of us have just hoped that this would go away and that we would get back to normal, maybe all of us. Um, but acknowledging that this is here and that we have to figure out ways around this feels really important um, just in the idea of how change happens. And so um, I do think that for mental health, it's a bit more challenging because our, our contacts are longer, but I really appreciate the effort that's going into building more capacity for clinicians and for our clients to make this work. And thank you, Heather and Adrian. I appreciate how you reinforce the point that this technology, again, it, it is here to stay. But on the other hand, it's based on fundamentals. Technology is only an, a, a supplement. It is not taking the place of good clinical care, good support, good uh, ability to communicate with people to reduce isolation. Now, if we could quickly switch to some of the challenges. Uh, many people, uh, you've heard it already shared by our panelists, and many of you already know that there are several fundamental system and system, uh, syst systematic uh, issues that are uh, barriers to moving forward. First and foremost, broadband, the lack of broadband we have. We actually have to be considering how broadband could become a utility in this country. Secondly, the issue of affordability, the cost of different types of technologies. And finally, the issue of how will we use these connectivity to reach different population groups and have issues such as dig digital literacy, particularly older adults, when we look at other populations and even uh, language barriers and health literacy issues. So could each of you again share some points about what some of the biggest barriers, you've already shared a few wonderful examples of how you've taken these on and looking for new solutions. But what do you still see are some of the barriers that are still in front of us that we have to tackle? I think you just summarized so many of them, David. So I really appreciate that. Um, in terms of the, the basic fundamentals of device ownership and broadband and skills um, to be able to use technology, um, even I would say to do the phone visit um, um, modality, just making people comfortable with technology, smartphones, things like that. Um, across the population and not sort of the quote unquote worried well, who would be able to the quickest to engage with any new uh, modality that we roll out. So that's one. Um, I would say um, that maybe the flip side of that though is that um, technology can offer things to customize things. So I think we should also be thinking about the personalization that we might be able to offer. So maybe I'm gonna turn it into a positive um, statement. I think there are some big fundamental barriers but I do think there's some opportunities to use technology also to address some of our language uh, barriers and to think about it more systematically and deliver things to people that are customized for themselves. Um, and maybe this is an opportunity to embrace some of those big barriers and, and head on rather than sort of pivoting and saying that it's an adjunct to care, only an adjunct to care and not one of the primary ways in which we would deliver things. So those are just some, some few thoughts, but you really highlighted a lot of the big ones in my mind. Um, I think in addition to um, sort of the device piece and the data piece, um, I think on a system side, thinking through how do we actually make care accessible to everybody? So um, it's been a lot of focus on like the digital limitations, but there's like a whole workflow piece related to actually supporting different types of care for diverse patients. And that's something that I think that hasn't really, there's not good data on. It's really something that people are just figuring out as the as they go, I know our, our clinic, and when we first came out, like every single day, there was a change in a workflow responding to some, a, bear, a challenge that we had before. And so I think that's an additional challenge is just thinking through, you know, I think there was a question related to interpreter use, you know, that's something we thought about through about in person care. But as we roll out, you know, phone visits or video visits incorporating our workflow for how do we schedule interpreters or how do we bring interpreters into that visit that's just sort of um, an aspect of care that that we need to be thinking about so i think it's it's not only the digital device piece to actually be able to do it but all of the ser service and the wraparound and all the workflows to support equitable care in, in telehealth and i'll piggyback on that yes technology 
is key here. Um, but the issues that have been in, in play for a long time uh, related to access continue to be barriers. Um, insurance and knowledge of resources, stigma around mental health in particular. I mean, we saw a huge drop off of people requesting new services at the beginning of COVID in, the, in early March, where we would have five or six new requests for services a day. Um, we were getting to zero or one or two a week. And so I think that people were really orienting to what is still happening out there, like what services are still available. And um, as was shared before, it was like people don't, didn't understand if the telehealth, if the, if the reminder was in, for an in-person appointment or for a telephone appointment, I think we're really having to to provide information in a lot of different ways to our community about what still exists, what people can access, given that um, many of the things that services that we uh, accessed before have been shut down. Yeah. And I'll just add, this is um, slightly shifting gears, but uh, because I focus a lot in the, in the research world, and this is kind of thinking the development of new digital tools or telehealth and so on, one of my concerns is now that we have to increase the remote uh, connection with folks that we uh, uh, recruit for our studies, uh, we still have to do things like uh, recruit remotely, have people sign documents via DocuSign, for example. And that's something that we've really had a big challenge doing. So we've had to exclude some people from participating in our research studies because of that. And that is, that's a huge problem because those are likely the people that we need to have as part of the conversation the most. Um, and this is another example of one of those kind of policy type issues that we need to figure out. Um, oftentimes the things that we put in place to protect folks are often the things that uh, end up hurting them the most. So they have the negative side effects of not allowing them to access these things. Um, so we really need to be mindful about how we can reduce some of those barriers. I think this uh, softening of the HIPAA privacy barriers, while we still need to keep that front and center, but we saw how uh, lim how reducing that has been able to open up access. And we need to think about different ways to do that in other areas. Thank you for taking us into some of the practical issues. And what we have been seeing now, we have several questions coming in. And I think it's time for us to take a few more from our audience, some very concrete issues, as well as some of the philosophical points of how we will maximize the use of these new tools, uh, particularly when we get past COVID um, situations. So the one key issue that has been raised by a number of folks on the uh, call is specifically, can you people share some of the issues around the actual costs, the payment structures, the mechanisms. How different has this been? And what are some of the issues that could still be a barrier? Or how do we anticipate the costs of paying for this type of new telehealth and remote care? It hasn't impacted our service delivery, the cost. I mean, if we serve people that are uninsured and have Medi-Cal or some version of that. And so when people, um, sign up quote unquote to receive services from us it's whatever is whatever is offered for a calendar year um so we are offering telehealth in the same way and cost um, mostly at no cost to the people that that we're providing services for um i think because i practice in a pretty large healthcare system um and you know, I'm not. I'm not trying to make the budget balance. I also am not seeing a lot of the cost-related issues. Um, but we do know, sort of overall. I think this is something that is definitely put on our radar. Uh, so initially, when the CARES Act was passed, um, they um, initially out pay parity, so allowed video visits to really be at the same reimbursement structure as in-person visits. And this was something that was really helpful for, I think, for a lot of clinics um, who really do rely on, on sort of their weekly intake to be able to reimburse, reimburse their staff. Um, but this was something that was a large concern, I think, for the clinics who had lots of patients 
um, who either maybe would be unable to access video visits because of a lot of the digital infrastructure issues we brought up before, as well as clinics who actually didn't have their own digital infrastructure to provide video visits. And so this is actually um, sort of a, a huge issue um, and it was something that a lot of uh, various medical organizations actually advocated for to try to get um, pay parity also for audio visits, um, which I think was recently passed, but is only applicable to some clinics and not to every clinic. Um, and those and the reimbursement for that is all, all on a CMS level. So that's the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So that only controls reimbursement for Medicare. Um, and lots of you know, private insurances have their own policies, as do each state's Medicaid, uh, Medicaid insurance as well. Uh, and so um, I think sort of to answer the question, it's sort of um, it, it's, it's in flux, basically. Reimbursement is pretty much all over the place. I think it's a huge issue um, for a lot of clinics that do primarily outpatient care and, and that are very much worried about how they're going to be able to keep, keep their clinic doors um, open. And of course, that's sort of from a, from a clinician side. I think from the patient side, um, they're probably... My sense is they're probably not going to see as many um, differences. I think this is a lot of the pay structure has really um, impacted systems, systems a lot more. And I would just add that on the patient side, uh, one cost that we need to be aware of is the use of data. So if people can get onto a video call, you know, folks with uh, less means often have uh, plans where you can't just use all the data you want, right? Because you're going to use up all your data for the month. Um, so those are, you know, going back to David's point about uh, looking at internet access and Wi-Fi as a utility, I think that that's definitely somewhere we need to be going um, if we're going to be doing more of this type of work. And for those of you who aren't familiar, the real change that's been occurring in terms of reimbursement and of, of the, the ability to pay for some of these services has been a very recent phenomena. With COVID-19, we're now seeing some dramatic changes in, in that direction. We have a few other questions regarding different populations and both the way to inform individuals. I'd love to hear your our panelists' perspective on how do we tell people about these new opportunities? How do we inform people about telehealth and visits? We heard a few examples, but also how do we then deal with some of the reservations? How do we, some of the natural barriers, for example, our older adults uh, who may not be as comfortable with some of the new technology solutions or how to uh, access them, et cetera. So love to have different perspectives shared now with how do we inform people more about this? Have we seen changes in it? And then how do we address the specific needs beyond language, beyond uh, the other barriers that are there to really make people comfortable with this space? Yeah, maybe I'll start really quickly um, from the perspective of, I do think people, older adults and people who aren't as familiar with video visits and things like that, I think we have to be aware that they're gonna need more time um, to be able to think about it and more time to try out a technology and use it. But I just wanted to, to think about that training and support piece that I mentioned briefly ahead of time. I just really think we need to think about systematizing that. I know it's a um, it can be a very big burden on the healthcare system. So the last thing I wanted to mention about that is there are a lot of community-based organizations. How can we think about better partnering to get um, patients support in using these things um, without sharing you know, health information, personal health information, but really getting them to be able to download an app or to be knowing about where the, the camera is on their device, things like that. And those, those have existed for a long time in the past. And I think we need to be reaching out um, the same way that uh, broadband might be a utility. I think we could do referrals out uh, potentially from the healthcare system for digital literacy support, the same way you might refer out for other um, services, like bolstering that as a part of our system, especially when we want to be doing this more at scale. So that's one point. And then making sure people know it's an option, offering it to more people, talking to them about it, um, communicating about that it's really about um, uh, trying to preserve their relationship and, and those kinds of things. I think we need to think about both of those together from my perspective. I think part of it is about expectations. I think sometimes we have uh, low expectations for clients that we work with and we say, well, they're not going to want to do it. Or they say, no, thanks. And we just take them for their word. Uh, one of the things that we've learned in doing our texting program for some years now is we taught people, we sat with people and taught them how to text message, how to respond to messages. And that in and of itself was an intervention, exposing them to technology. And then that allowed them to use the technology in many different ways. 
So I think a big thing is just trying it, trying it at least once and no, it doesn't work for everybody, but for many people, once they try it and get one experience, then it kind of sets off where they're much more comfortable doing it going forward. And if I could switch us quickly, because you are experts in so many areas, but particularly also in mental health and a few, we have a few questions related to how do we see even deeper support for those issues? We know that uh, while we have some benefits, some people would say as people are learning how to telecommute and use uh, news services such as telehealth, we also see an increase now in potential for isolation, depression, et cetera. So could you share again some of the ways you envision we can support people and beyond the projects you've described, what we'll need to do uh, in the area of mental health? Uh, I'll speak to that. I wanted to just back up a second to, to answer the, the question before. And um, there was a question also around having a telehealth technologist. <laughs> um, and I think that that also would be helpful. I mean, I don't know if we could dream about what would be available to us because I, I struggle with technology. And so then helping my clients to, to, to download and to do it is also a challenge for me and for many of my colleagues. Um, and I, I guess that would be my question for Adrian as well, is if someone says no, do we take it as a hard no, or do we keep asking them and offering over and over again? Because um, we really want to be patient-centered and we really want to listen to what our clients have to say. But in this, in this time, we really, we want to push too. So I think it's that fine line of, of pushing and accepting when it's something that's just not going to work for right now. And I would, and Adriana and I worked together at San Francisco General, and I can, I can remember that feeling of, of building capacity around technology with, you know, a lot of older patients that we would have that are Spanish speaking that if we sat down and really gave them like really one-on-one -on -one attention around technology, you could just see their face light up and the way that they experienced learning something new was such um, a gift for them. Um, and they really believed that we were sending them those text messages, <laughs> that like Adrian and I were sending them text messages, reminding them to go for a walk. Um, and so whether it was a, a, a machine that was sending out that message, they really interpreted that as us. Um, so that, to speak to that last point, and maybe Adrian, you could just could speak to that piece around the push um, tension related to technology. And sorry, we'll move on to the next question afterwards. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, you know, I think particularly from a mental health perspective, I think a lot of the work we do is push people into uncomfortable spaces, right? You want to nudge people um, to kind of improve and better their lives in different ways. And I think this, I see a parallel in this way. I think uh, a lot of us, particularly during these times that are, you know, stressful, um, somebody talked about um, the impacts of, of this whole experience on mental health. And I think what we are seeing is that, yes, all of this anxiety and fear is interacting with uh, what people have been dealing with to begin with. I think particularly when you think about anxiety disorders, uh, PTSD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, things like that, this is magnifying those types of issues. Um, feelings of stress and anxiety are magnifying. Uh, and I'll take this moment to plug a program that we just developed, um, kind of related to thinking about what are we going to be doing going forward. Uh, we developed a program called Stay Well at Home. It's a texting program, uh, and in Spanish, Bienestar en Casa. Uh, and folks can sign up uh, to receive uh, text messages every day on uh, coping strategies during this time. Uh, they, you can type the word well, W-E-L-L, in English or bien, B-I-E-N in Spanish to 415-480-5211. Hopefully this will be posted somewhere else. Um, but to say that I think that uh, particularly when we're thinking about mental health, going forward, we're gonna see mental health probably lag in terms of uh, how COVID is impacting folks. Right now, the focus is on physical health as it should be, but I think we're going to see that the mental health of the population is going to be impacted, not only by the disease itself, but by all the um, economic and social consequences as well. And I'll say that many of our clients that were in services related, I'll say this more for teenagers and for kids, that 
there was a big relief when school was out. <laughs> so we saw a lot of symptomology decrease related to bullying or academic stress or conflict at school. So there was, there's some silver lining, not really, but um, I think I agree with you, Adrian, that this is, um, it's, we're gonna see a, a big balloon starting to happen and coming forward as this shelter in place continues and as economic um, stress increases that we're gonna have to be really ready and increase our capacity as, as we go into, into more of the summer months. These have been fantastic points. We're getting approaching the end of our hour. Uh, what I would like to do is again, share with all of you that we were not able to get to all of your questions. We do see more. We would like to be able to uh, respond to those if possible later. Also colleagues that are on the line today have shared with us several resources. Uh, we have a great deal, not only at Berkeley, but within here in California that as you want to explore this further or looking for more specific information, we'd be happy to help you find that. I'd like to close with asking each of our panelists to share one more point. And we're going to do this very quickly, but I would like them to each say, once we get past COVID-19, what do you envision for telehealth moving forward? Because this has been a game changer. Will it stay? Will it change? Will it change the way we look at healthcare and the way we interact uh, with each other. So I'll let each of our panelists uh, respond. What will be coming in the future? I, I'm happy to get us started. Um, I definitely think telehealth is, is here to stay. I think, um, you know, healthcare unfortunately has always been a little slow to adopt um, changes in technology, but this has really pushed us forward. And I think now that it's been here, I, I don't see clinicians or patients saying like, we don't ever want this um, back. I think the big things for really for us to sort of um, try to figure out right now is, is um, one, like who is, who's best served by telehealth? Like what are the best use case scenarios for it? Um, and, and, you know, some people are still better served by in-person care, but really um, thinking about patient convenience and patient-centered care, like there's definitely patients who telehealth is better for. And I think the second piece is if we're going to support it, I'm really thinking through the reimbursement piece, the pavement structure, building in the infrastructure so that um, if we're going to support it, it is accessible for all, right? I think there's a lot of attention um, devoted on this now. And we really have to use this time now and the attention given to telehealth to think about, you know, making broadband a utility, um, building in infrastructure, not only for patients, but also for for um, on the clinician side um, as well. You know, FCC had a grant recently to support um, clinicians purchasing devices to actually be able to provide to help telehealth services. And then I think the reimbursement piece, um, not just specifically only for tel telehealth visits, but like the remote monitoring tools, all the other types of things that we wanna be able to deliver remotely to deliver high quality care. Thank you, Elaine. Courtney? Keep back on that. Yeah, maybe I can keep going, David. Um, I think this is a unique moment in time and doing this work and thinking about uptake of tools for both providers and systems and patients prior to this, I think a lot of the things have been removed in terms of some of the policy barriers and some of the um, initial resistance to trying out some of these tools in, in real life care. And so I think it's a moment for telehealth to stay and I hope we can do it right with respect to equity. I think, um, I think we can think hard about it and maybe at least track numbers be really careful about how we think about it rather than um, throwing up our hands a year from now and saying, oh, it, it, it increased disparities, um, but we can't, we can't keep doing this. Hopefully we can think about it more proactively um, since there's a, there's, a, there's a light on that in this moment and do something different. It's not gonna be perfect, but now's the moment to try out some things and to see, see what's happening and to try to get more people um, using it and, and see what's working, what's not working. And Heather? Um, I hope that those of us that have been listening today feel um, a bit of more motivated as I do, having listening, listened to my colleagues around adapting. And um, I have heard the message loud and clear that we can't just say it doesn't work, that we have to find workarounds and we have to, have to make it work. So um, I hope that we continue to have technical assistance and quality assistance, um, may that be from the people doing the research, um, from people that are that know um, about the technology, and continue to have support trainings, offerings for clinicians around how to best um, build interventions, build activities, build ways of connecting with our, our clients and patients around that. So I think 
um, building skills, building um, both on the patient and the uh, clinician side are really going to be important going forward. Yeah, and I think uh, from uh, the field of, of psychology, we know that the best predictor of a future behavior is a past behavior. So I think the fact that we're all that a lot of folks are doing it means that we're going to keep doing it. Uh, we need to now focus on where for where and for whom it's going to work the best uh, and integrate it within kind of good stepped care models. Um, and then I think finally, uh, really trying to uh, reach out to our partners, particularly in the Bay Area, um, in Silicon Valley, uh, folks in digital health to really think about how you can make an impact in reaching out the communities in most need. Well, we couldn't ask for a better summary from the four of you. Uh, this has been fantastic in terms of what you've shared with us, how you've pushed us to think about the future. And again, very encouraging word about what we've seen in, in, in a time that's been very challenging for all of us. So your speakers today, as you've seen, were Heather Ladoff, Courtney Lyles, Elaine Cohn, and Adrian Aguilara. And I would like to not only thank them, but thank Dean Linda Burton and the School of Social Welfare for allowing us to put this program together. And again, for what you are seeing, how our colleagues here at Berkeley, UCSF, and the community are all working together in this time to advance how we can help individuals and come out of this even stronger and better. Thank you for your attention today. We look forward to hearing from you. And please participate in future conversations with the Chancellor.